All right, thanks. So at this time, we're going to invite the co-leads from the community engagement panel to come up and share their report out. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Can you all hear us? Good morning. These mics are on. This will be a comment. Very Good morning. So um, in our group yesterday, we started out um, our discussions with a story from a research participant um, from one of my research studies. And I'd like to share it today um, to get you really um, thinking about how disparities and equities and injustices show up for people, particularly for older African-Americans with chronic pain. So I'll read her, um, her story here. Oh, you just got arthritis here and gave me some inflammatory pills and sent me on out the door and said, no, you're too young for surgery. Oh, you'll be all right. I literally had to go in there the same way in tears. All that he did was took x-rays and, okay, here, take these pills and go home. That's it. That's all they do. Now, he tried to get me jail. He tried to get me MRIs. He tried to get me knee braces. Medicaid wouldn't pay for nothing. If you can't afford it, you're just out of luck. They sent me information about the knee braces. I told them, I said, I got Medicare. Don't start to September. Oh, well, call us back and hang up the phone. Medicaid sure isn't going to help you. I'm just being honest. That's why we as black people do not go to the doctor because of the way that because of the way they get treated when they go. Even if it's in, even if it's in the emergency rooms, they look at you the same way. Because when I was sick with that pain under my arm, I went three times. Oh, take some ibuprofen and go home. They actually think only black people come in here for pain medicine. They need to get out of that mentality. Said, well, tell her they come into the walk-in clinic. I was like, well, I just be dang. Reason I say that, there was this white lady came in, this white family. Woman was, I don't even know if she had insurance or not. Oh, they got her off, rushed her off quick. Shoot, I just nodded my head. I said, okay. And the other thing about it, if it depends on what kind of insurance you got. A lot of times, if we do have insurance, like you said, it's not necessarily the right insurance or we don't have insurance, whereas white people, they have Medicare plus something else. But they had better resources as far as doctor-wise than we did. Just that even to this day, some of them still got better resources to doctors than we do. Prejudice is still prejudice. Prejudice to me is not just the color. If it was a choice between this black man and this white man, white man more likely gonna go first because the black before the black man does. If your bank account don't look right or your insurance, that's why you see a, a lot of us going through it worse than you do the whites. So um, one of the things, I guess, kind of encapsulating um, our discussions yesterday and using this story as kind of our backdrop um, was really the need for what we are calling pain affirming care and plus relationship based trust, especially when you're trying to engage with um, the community. So when you're trying to create equity um, within community engaged research or for community engagement, you can either be a bulldozer, a builder, or both. And sometimes, even though there's a foundation already laid for community engaged research, sometimes you have to change the structures, right? Um, so for example, you may need to repair the foundation. And this could signify um, of the process of healing the community. You may need to knock down walls. Um, this would be likened unto maybe reconciliation. So making sure that you understand the history of the community. And then if there are some um, ill research ills that were done in the past, you really take that time to acknowledge that 
and then reconcile those things. Um, you may need to expand the space or the rooms. And that really just means opening yourself up to be transparent about the whole process of research. You may need to build a new foundation. Sometimes the foundation is just so severely cracked and destroyed that you really do need to start from scratch. Um, and that can be likened really to consistency and building the strength of the community. And then at other times, you may need to just add new features to the structure or to the building. And this would include resources, skills, or maybe just empowering the community. So strategies for community engaged research. We had an opportunity to really have an amazing conversation um, yesterday, and we had some people share a lot of great things. As you see on the screen, we talked about fair compensation, which we started off the whole day talking about, and that was repeated throughout. But we also talked about paid community advisory boards to ensure that you have the community's input, asking for community um, asking the community what they need, really going into that community instead of just forcing yourself in the community and doing things before you get an idea. Meeting people where they are. So that looks like in person, digital, accessibility. That also looks like adapting to different languages and also changing certain things. We know that there's language that has been used for a long time that should not even be used and we don't know that. So just making sure that we... Um, adapt to that. Transparency, vulnerability on both ends, basically opening up um, as a research, as you're going into the community, explain why you are doing that research. Why are you there in the first place? Some people that do research, it actually means a lot to them. And I'm sure that the people in the community would love to hear that, as well as asking why the people that are participating are interested in participating in um, the research study. You also have agreements, um, I think Mitch actually brought this up about how they have partnerships with several nonprofits at his organization um, in an effort to put agreements in paper. If you are a nonprofit, you apply for grant funding, they like to see MOUs and agreements that you have with other people. So doing that would be really good. You also have engaging with part participants from the very beginning, which looks like do not wait to start to research and then wait to have a conversation, get them on board immediately. Pay researchers, actually Ronnie had an amazing idea, pay research for the time spent volunteering with communities. Um, this can look like corporate responsibility to corporations, but this is something that people can actually put in place. And then Eden had an amazing idea of seven touches, which they actually do. Um, seven touches could look like the things that we mentioned, but it can look like other things, just giving them a call, asking them how they are, what do they need from you, um, just making sure you are extending yourself. Um, we have challenges as well for community-engaged research. Uh, resources look like time. Funding and personnel, and we all know that in this room, it's just really difficult. So that that could be one of the biggest challenges we have, but then also time expectations for doctors. We had a really good conversation about how um, the transparency between doctors sometimes is a little difficult. Uh, as patients, we may think, oh, the doctor doesn't care. You're only spending 10 minutes with me. When the truth of the matter is they're only allowed to do so much in that short period of time. And then we also talked about the messaging, how patients can reach out during messaging. Mitch told us that he stayed up until 1 a.m. trying to respond to messages. And the last thing you need is a doctor staying up at 1 a.m. trying to respond to your messages. They need as much sleep as possible. Um, also choosing appropriate imagery for different audiences. That can be like digital, social media, graphics, all of those things. You want to make sure you include people, but it is difficult when there's so many intersectionalities in it. So that is a difficult part. Also, having lived experience on research team isn't quite enough. You can have someone, for example, with endometriosis on your team, but that one person does not speak for the whole community. So you have to be a part of that community. You have to go and volunteer. You have to be engaged in that community to kind of get an understanding. And then lastly, compensation regulatory issues through IRB. We talked about there is a threshold. You cannot pay people a certain amount because it starts to look like bribery. So you have to be able to uh, play around with that and come up with some ideas. Um, 
Dr. Starr actually mentioned, uh, if we're not able to pay you this amount, is there anything else we can do or assist you? So that may be some things you can look at. So thankfully, there are a lot of good opportunities uh, for us to do this. Um, you know, we're going to put a, since we are at NIH uh, here, uh, funding structures, there is an opportunity there to support all the critical phases of this research. And we talked a lot about how much time has to go into actually building relationship with community. This isn't going to happen in even one or two years. This is probably going to be, you know, five years, six years. And what, you know, how can we change? Our funding structures approach this a little bit differently so that we can really spend the time so that we can understand the people that we're working with and hopefully serving. And so it's really um, funding through all those phases, the preparatory, the implementation, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to be out there in the community uh, to maintain the relationships. And then also very importantly in the dissemination phase, making sure that we're uh, disseminating this information to people who want to hear it doing it in a way that doesn't disadvantage them. There's uh, many um, examples where researchers unintentionally have you know, uh, shared information and it's been to the disadvantage of a community. So we have to, you know, what can we put in place there? Uh, not only funding, but also, you know, good practices for this. Um, I don't think we can emphasize enough how important it is to be a part of the community, become a part of the community, not just helicopter in, helicopter out. And you know, one of the things that we've done with our teams is uh, we volunteer. We pay our research teams eight hours a month to go out in the community, choose you know one of the partners that we're working with, and go and volunteer and keep on volunteering. And so we have a record with a few organizations of three years of monthly volunteering, and that's the way we get to know our community. Uh, be a resource. You know, we have a lot of resources at our fingertips um, as researchers, um, you know, pain resources, um, being willing to give out information, put things together, uh, do presentations, and also thinking about sustainability. When we are designing our research, making sure that we do something that can be used in the community without us as the researcher. Can we leave it there? And, and I think that's a really big challenge. Begin with the end in mind. And I think this is where our um, implementation research can become really important. There's a real opportunity in co-learning um, together and relearning um, as part of our cultural responsiveness and learning the history of the locale in which we're in. There's really unique histories geographically in neighborhoods. I didn't know that. You know, I come from Winnipeg, Canada, and I am doing research in North Minneapolis. Wow, I had a lot to learn. And then I didn't know, you know, the poor relationship with the University of Minnesota. I didn't know why they didn't want to talk to me. Well, they, they, taught me pretty soon um, why, why that was, and, and you have to be willing to listen. Um, and that leads to researcher vulnerability. You know, you have to be willing to say you don't know. Um, you have to be willing to hear some really hard things, um, to be introspective and look at what you might not have done well in the past. I know that if we've been doing research for a long time, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't done well. And so are we willing to look at ourselves and do things differently? Um, sharing our own story, we already referred to that, but I think that's really, really important. Why are we really there? And I don't think that's just the canned speech that you give. It really is, again, real inflection and reflection. Why are you doing this work? Why does it matter? And showing up as that real whole person in those conversations. People know when you're not being authentic. They do. And we can't, you know, expect them to trust us as researcher if, you know, we're not being fully um, transparent with them. And then it's really important to give participants choices. You know, the autonomy matters here. Um, it's just not us giving them limited choices and, and telling them what to do. You know, these uh, are ideas of how you opt in and opt out, for instance, communication preferences. Some people want to hear about the dissemination opportunity, like what comes out of the research, but some people don't. Give them choices. And there's also opportunities for different participation options. You know, maybe they don't want to be in your trial, but maybe there's uh, an opportunity to do some qualitative work where they share their story. So creating different opportunities uh, for people to take part. So those are some of the things that came out of our discussion. 
what is <laughs> what is needed to build trusting, long lasting relationships? Um, as you see, being clear on your expectations, what research is, what it isn't, aligning your research values with the community values, just having that relationship with the community. If you're going into the community and volunteering and supporting and engaging, these are things that you have already connected on. So it should be easier for you to navigate. Um, that goes into investing in the community, making sure that you are somebody who's adding to the community and not triggering the community because you want to do the research. Um, involving the community and identifying areas to research, it goes back to asking them questions. Where do you see fit? Because what we may see um, as researchers may not be the same thing. We Well, I'm not a researcher, not fully, but... Um, Ronnie mentioned coming from a science place, they were taught to go into the field with, you know, leave your emotions at the door. Don't walk in here all uh, with your baggage. Disassociate. But the thing that you need to associate with is the community. So being authentic um, and having those uh, conversations to identify research areas may be different. They may have a different perspective from you. So it would be uh, important to get that information. Listening to patients' stories, figuring out ways to integrate into research process, choosing outcomes that patients care about. Um, and there are a lot of patients that care a lot about some of the outcomes because they want to see what they can do with that information. Um, as you know, policies can come out of research. It's really great to have this information in the community. And then taking into account the potential impact of harm if community is historically marginalized. Um, Dr. Starr, you mentioned this, and Ronnie mentioned this, and it's it's really interesting because there's a long history uh, for a lot of institutions, and some institutions do a really great job recognizing the damage that they've done. They've done programs. They've uh, actually put out documentation on apologizing on what they've done, but there are institutions that actually don't recognize that, and if we are at these institutions, going into the community, the community will never forget what happened, but the staff and the people that come in, the faculty are going to rotate. So they just have to make sure that they do their education on where they're working and how their impact has been in the community. Should be late. It's the first time we're seeing this. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, did we want to ask some questions? Two, by the way, okay. yeah. So as we look at this, um, I will just note that a lot of our discussions yesterday were based on just general principles of best practices for community engagement. It will take some additional conversations to really kind of drill down to how does this apply to uh, people with pain? And um, so I guess we want to open it up now to questions, thoughts, ideas. Um, about community engaged research or community engagement. Maybe you have examples that you'd like to share or questions to ask us. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Adam Hirsch. I am uh, representing our panel on multi-level interventions. Uh, full disclosure from the start, I feel a bit self-conscious. I didn't know we were preparing slides. So the community star, jeez. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Uh, I will um, first uh, thank you, Sharice, Janelle, and Katie, and the other people who made this happen. Um, Karen, who was our NIH liaison for our panel for keeping us on track. And uh, Andrew, who's not here, but took notes that um, tried to um, bring together to have something that's useful for us to, to chew on. Uh, also, thanks to Beth and Ashley, who were co-leads for this. It was wonderful working with you, and also to our panelists. It was very, it was a lively group. It's it's uh, not known how these things will go. If these will be just really just dead air the whole time, or people are quarreling or whatever. And I felt like we struck a happy medium of a little bit of Pluralness, uh, which was mostly Cam uh, attacking questions and questioners, but um, 
I, I see what I mean. I should have we we should have written better questions. Yes, yeah. Uh, Cam will be the the lead on these things in the future. Uh, so just to give you a heads up about how we approach this, this is a, an impossible topic. Multi level interventions for pain and pain disparities. It kind of feels like all right, come up with the solutions to all the problems at all the levels. Uh, so we were trying to make uh, this more manageable as a discussion prompt. So we we were guided by a couple big picture questions, um, namely, what should be the priority in multi-level interventions to address pain disparities? And by priority, we were thinking about how should we prioritize in a way things like outcomes, feasibility, timelines. These were some of the things that we kept in mind as we um, engaged in our work together. Uh, what are the best or most meaningful ways to measure these priorities? And then third big picture question for us was, what would it look like to successfully meet these priorities? So these were kind of the meta level questions that we were dealing with. And then we went from there to discuss four specific topics. And I don't have slides, so I'll try to put kind of verbal signposts up. Fortunately, we have these, which I think are in chronological order and, and uh, align with how I will um, discuss our readout. So our first um, specific topic was um, reflecting on the social determinants of health that contribute to pain disparities at different levels and the attention or lack thereof that they receive in our work and how they might be best addressed through multi-level interventions. So again, starting big, um, we discussed some of the customary ones that give a lot of attention, um, things like poverty, built environment, time constraints. Um, but we also discussed some of the nuances such as how being just above the poverty line may actually increase one's burdens because they no longer qualify for certain benefits. And so that's a social determinant of health that um, addresses poverty, yes, but also the, the variability within these groups and, and the different types of struggles or barriers that they might face. We also discussed how members of certain communities uh, need to dress up or peacock their education is Kiana, uh, it's a great term I borrowed from her, um, their education in order to be taken seriously when presenting to healthcare facilities with their pain. But there's a perversity in this and that the same things that they need to do to um, prove or show that they're uh, uh, worthwhile um, and worthy recipients of pain care can also be held against them. So someone dresses up to be taken seriously, but then is judged as that person can't be in that much pain, they're too put together. So we discussed a lot about those, um, those subtleties in the social determinants of health and how um, this code switching burden um, is not evenly distributed across groups. Uh, as one example of a multi-level intervention that highlights a lot of the themes of this first topic, um, was uh, we talked about um, a very specific example of a community accessible swimming pool. So perhaps at a high school, a lot of high schools have um, swimming pools that are really only used in um, restricted hours, but then are just lying there, just waiting to be used. So might that be a level of intervention that then gets paired with providers? So it's a partnership between a community accessible swimming pool with providers who are then aware of the benefits of aqua therapy for chronic pain and how different communities have more or less accessibility to those resources. And then the providers can then link it to their pain care for the patient in front of them. So that was one example of a multi-level intervention uh, that really uh, highlights a lot of our discussions for that topic. So we then went from there transitioning into the second thing we focused on, which was infrastructure. So what infrastructure is needed to support and or deliver these multi-level resource or multi-level interventions to under-resourced communities? That was a, a particular focus of this discussion. And a lot of this discussion uh, centered around patient navigators and translation services and peer supports. And not just whether these things are available, but also the need to truly integrate them into the system. So they're not just add-ons, but they're a central part of the system. Uh, these resources can help uh, in the clinical space, but another thing that uh, was brought up in our discussion is how they can help address another key social determinant of pain and pain disparities, and that is loneliness. 
And so these, um, we can think about these resources as hitting on multiple targets at different levels. Uh, we also discuss, discussed infrastructure involving community-based and community-informed repositories of information and resources. And part of this discussion involved, uh, we were grappling with this issue of quality. So what deserves to, to be included in these repositories and how do we judge deservedness? So we're talking about uh, things like scientific data, evidence-based practices, right? That might have currency to me as a scientist um, and my epistemology says that's the way that we know how things work or that's the most important way, but that's not the only way. There's best clinical practices that might inform the types of resources we have in these repositories. And then uh, another thing that came up that's really important that doesn't get enough attention and certainly doesn't get enough um, equal weight in terms of currency of knowledge and that is community-based perspectives and knowledge. So communities have been solving these problems and grappling with these issues and have their own repository of knowledge that we don't always privilege in our evidence-based or clinical guidelines. And so we're, we're grappling with some of the, the tensions of um, weighing different sources of evidence in terms of deciding which resources go into the community-based repository. So then uh, I will actually float over because I think these are... The, um... The keyboard is how you can advance it before. Now I pushed the button, the same button, multiple times, maybe. Uh, six. Yeah, or you just ask Sharice and she's got the magic touch. Oh, uh, the shame, the shame. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this discussion uh, segued into our third topic, and so we, a lot of our discussion, um, it felt like we were doing the community engaged panel. Um, there's, there aren't clear um, boundaries. Naturally, these things are going to overlap. And so um, our third discussion was actually on identifying cultural and community specific approaches to multi level interventions, and specifically what should get more attention in, the, in our conversations. And how can we actively involve people from communities experiencing pain disparities to help shape these multi-level interventions? So a major theme of this discussion was on um, the challenges of even thinking about this topic. It just seems so enormous in general and particularly difficult given our increasingly disconnected and sorted, segregated and atomized world in general and in healthcare. Uh, so we talked about the opportunities and challenges to use technologies to create a social network around patient care in real time, not just here, take a leaf flip back to your community, but doing this in real time. Uh, of note, um, it was important to um, uh, reflect on the fact that communities are already doing this without us. So like Cam and his family and his community, they built this. And so we, we have to be humble about, um, we're not the only generators of, of these initiatives. A lot of these initiatives are already being um, uh, generated and sustained because we're late to the game. And so we should approach this with humility. Um, so then um, perhaps that should lead us to ponder on a different question. And that is how can we convince communities to actively involve us and their work, us being scientists and clinicians. So when thinking about these multi-level interventions, we also discuss the importance of including um, people with lived experience at all levels of the process. And uh, the community engaged panel spoke a lot about this, um, but this starts from idea generation to refinement, deployment, assessing outcomes, et cetera, not just at the beginning. And we also discuss various ways to um, educate and um, train up a partnership workforce um, of people with lived experience um, on how best to partner with scientists and clinicians. So we're um, thinking about NIH has these mechanisms to support pre-doc, post-doc, K awards, early career scientists. Might there be an opportunity for a mechanism to um, do similarly for people with lived experiences? And it might be a parallel mechanism to um, help generate a well-rounded workforce in this space. 
Uh, we also discussed um, in this topic and in reaction to other prompts, taking a broader perspective on multi-level interventions. So that is a multi-level intervention might focus on social justice issues more broadly, not necessarily specific to pain, uh, because there is the idea that interventions that address social justice at multiple levels might in fact be pain interventions. And so we put that up as, a, as something to reflect on, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but a related topic of discussion was on the tension between the individual and group level perspectives. Um, this tension really comes up in terms of how we measure outcomes. We um, have individuals, I almost said participants, but I caught myself, thank you in the back for, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll probably fail, but I, I caught myself once, so pat on the back to me. Um, we, we have individual people um, complete these measures, but our statistics are largely at the group level. And yet then we also talk about using our group level data to inform precision medicine. And it's just like a lot of back and forth. And so um, there's not an easy answer to that, but it's something that we might um, think uh, more deeply about in terms of doing these interventions. And our fourth and final topic was on outcomes and metrics. So how best to capture the impact of our multi-level interventions for pain disparities. So there was a lot of discussion uh, on listening to and acting on what the local communities say. Uh, the previous panel's discussion hit on this. Um, they're the experts in defining what are their key outcomes and scientists and clinicians might then bring um, their own um, expertise to bear on how best to measure and track these outcomes. So it's leveraging the, the relative expertise of, of all participants. A uh, major challenge of this is when the perspectives and needs of the community are in tension with the demands of grant review panels in terms of pre-specified outcomes. It's really hard to, to do a power analysis on pre-specified outcomes and then go to a community where that's not really the way to measure these things. And what you're measuring might differ across time. So how do you account for that in grant proposals and so we, we think that there needs to be some um, broadening of our thinking about how we um, review grants, how we um, write RFAs for grants. And we discuss the needs uh, to be very intentional about these outcomes and metrics so that they are appropriately tailored to the intervention, the level or levels that the interventions are targeting, and the reality that some things are more readily measured than others, which doesn't make them more or less important. And this was an area where um, the importance of qualitative and mixed methods research was raised over and over again. And so a related point of discussion was the issue of aiming for and or achieving across the board gains where everyone benefits. So we might have multi-level interventions um, that raise the floor for alls, for all, but um, the inequities persist or might even increase versus specifically targeting people and helping raise the floor for them that doesn't raise it for everyone, but it decreases the inequity. And so there, there's some, some tension in that that um, we need to be very mindful of as we're thinking about these multi-level interventions. And then ultimately, uh, we need to grapple with what these metrics are for and who are they for. So the answers to these questions will inform um, our selections and our decisions. Uh, we discussed dissemination and translation of the science on multi-level interventions for pain disparities, how to get research findings to the clinic, how to get clinical observations and experiences into the research lab, and how to get all of this um, to the funders of science and to the insurance companies who are gatekeepers for much of our care. Okay, home stretch. Um, we then return to our big picture questions, which are what should be the priorities? How do we best measure these priorities? And what would it look like to successfully um, meet these? Uh, so we engage this final discussion with an eye towards the near term, just to try to focus our, our work. Um, so thinking of five-year projects that would be possible to do, what we need to generate the data to support the policy and community efforts. Uh, so we were a bit pressed for time here, but uh, there were a few things that uh, jumped out from the notes. 
Uh, one idea that we discussed was uh, whether to um, whether and how to assess pain outcomes as part of projects that focus on social justice, but that are not explicitly about pain. So, for example, um, projects that address housing and food insecurity. We, th if those are existing projects, we might piggyback on top of those to leverage these projects outside of pain to generate new ideas and data for subsequent projects that are pain specific. So an NIH administrative supplement might be one mechanism for supporting this or some different, uh, maybe new grant mechanisms. Um, that being said, we need to be very careful to protect against the tourism that Hal mentioned. Um, so tack-ons um, can be really nice leveraging existing resources and they could also be an example of tourism where you just kind of come in and, and do a really um, weak just addition to get a little bit more money and a little bit more data. So another recurring theme was community-based participatory research or community dialogues. Um, here we discussed how the projects um, provide critical information needed to develop and test these new multi-level interventions. And the idea of having funding opportunities um, that require the involvement of a community advisory board. Jamie's question in the um, in discussion uh, in the previous uh, panel um, readout um, address this. Uh, so doing this in a meaningful non-tokenized way, requiring specific investment, especially in the first few years, that are separate from just routine study setup, having earmarks supports to do the work, the heavy lifting to provide the on-ramp is something that um, we think is necessary. And um, doing this work actually might turn uh, some former tourists into actual citizens and residents because they've been incentivized to actually do more than just swoop in. So to wrap up, uh, I've Feel like this was an engaging discussion. Uh, we did talk about multi-level interventions focused at each level, the person with pain, people they interact with, where they get care, where they live, the policies and general beliefs. Um, I have a companion document that uh, addresses some of our more specific uh, um, uh, discussion points at each of these levels, but I did not include that here. And so thanks again to Beth and Ashley, and uh, I will stop. Yeah. All right, we're getting started. Thank you all. Last last session. You ready? Okay. All right. So I am gonna get started because I got a plane to catch. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we were the workforce and collaborations panel. Um, I've been tasked with uh, distilling a lot of rich conversation into some sound bites. Um, I first want to give a shout out. You saw our Co -lead, our topic co-leads and we'll, you know, I'll bring them up after the summary, but I want to acknowledge our panelists. Um, so Dr. Burrell Gooden, Dr. L. Lett, Dr. Flavia Campos, Dr. Brendan Ng, uh, Dr. Uh, Lauren Davis, and uh, Mr. Tom Young. And the lens through which we uh, see the world and see the research um, made for an enriching conversation um, about a variety of topics that you'll see here. Um, this is a distillation of the distillation because um, we covered a lot of ground. So I, with that, I will jump into kind of the major points. So the first part of our panel, we wanted to talk about diversity. We were challenged by Dr. Baker to uh, come up with our definition of diversity through our own lens because this set the stage for the conversations and the questions, the meta level questions that we were uh, asking in the other panels. And so this was a graphic that was, you know, served, in, served as a starting point. Um, and 
I think that one of the things that came out specifically for me is that we look at these things as static, um, but they're not static. So I have moderate hearing loss. That's a diagnosis, right? Uh, is it becoming an identity? Not sure, but I find myself talking about it a lot because it's affection, affecting my functionality as a community member and as a researcher. So I have to talk about it in order to function. So those type of things um, kind of came up in this discussion. So I won't read every slide word for word, um, but these are just some of the major themes that came out when we talked about defining diversity and how you apply this to building a workforce in paint equity. Um, talked about the recognition of multiple dimensions, how it's addressed in funding mechanisms. And there's some meta level themes that have emerged to me, um, just given what we've heard from the other two panels. We need infrastructure, we need money, <laughs> um, and we need the disposition and intentionality around community engagement. So that came out in our panel as well. Um, addressing structural barriers to um, include being more inclusive in our workforce um, and taking a lifespan pers perspective approach. Um, not thinking, oh, you have to do think about this at this point or at this point across uh, at in a person's life, in a researcher's life, thinking about it across the person's lifespan, given the fluidity of identity and the roles that we have as a result of these identities. I think one of the things that right off that Dr. Lett talked about when I think we take for granted in these spaces um, is that we talk about diversity often in isolation, well, we don't, but most people talk about diversity in isolation um, from equity and inclusion, and you can't build a workforce without all of those, and I would include belonging and access, because just because you're at the table and giving your ideas doesn't mean that you're credited with said ideas, and um, also that those ideas may not make it to the levels that they need to to be implemented into policy and practice. Um, and so making DEI part of a core competency, which we're talking about, is that even the right word to describe what we're doing um, came into question as well. But making DEI part of the culture of institutions and part of the, the culture of funding be, and mandating that, if you're wanting to create collaborations and a workforce um, that has the dispositional tools and skills needed to engage communities, um, you should mandate that and track that some type of way. Um, and acknowledging what the fluidity of people's identities brings to research uh, and community engagement practices. So then, so that set the stage. And so the next part of the panel was to address a two-part question. Uh, which was, you know, how would you define a meaningful and sustainable career in in this area, meaning pain equity research uh, researchers? And how would you uh, define meaningful and sustainable outcomes for from research for communities experiencing pain disparities? And one of the one of the big picture topics, which has which is why it has so many bullet points and stuff, is mentorship. Um, the availability of mentors. <laughs> um, I kind of stumbled into this work, um, but if people recruit and say, you would be good at this, come do it. Uh, that, that means a lot. So creating these opportunities, not just at the pre-doctoral training level, but earlier uh, in the lifespan and in the career tra trajectory of the person, while also leaving room for people who want to pivot later in their careers and providing mentorship as well at that stage. Um, incentivizing diverse fellowship or diversity fellowship to promote DEI and noting it as a measure of success. So when you have people who are part of your group that are doing the work, engaging in the self-reflection and the skills that are needed, how do we reward that and incentivize that for PIs and their teams? Um, we highlighted the need for 
longitudinal mentorship and sustainability. So this is not just a one-off. This is something that should be part of the culture and the workflow of the labs and of the departments and then the institutions and da 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 da. And evaluating how mentees are faring, particularly if PIs are um, uh, emphasizing that DEI is important in their grant proposals, how are how how is that evaluated and tracked? What are their mentees doing? Are they continuing in the work? Are they are the, is there attrition? Uh, is the D is the PI engaging in the work? So that came out as well. Uh, shifting the power dynamics, uh, I think. So Dr. Falcon came up with this uh, re reconceptualization. I heard, a, I think, in the multi-level interventions uh, report out about evidence base, but reconceptualizing what evidence is and means and broadening that. Uh, to a range, to a broader range of research, me uh, research methodologies and uh, conceptual frameworks, because currently we rely on the scientific canon, uh, meaning published papers, scientific proceedings, uh, grant summaries, where we tend to overlook the qualitative aspects or anecdotal evidence. People, people are the best authorities on themselves, right? So that is evidence, and if Physical therapy, shared decision making is a big part of our, well, I don't know how everybody else does it, but it's a big part of what we are trained to do. And empower, uh, explore novel approaches so that community orgs can get their own funding. <laughs> they don't have to be paired necessarily with PIs exclusively to conduct this research. What are some, what are some ways to engage and in these research in this initiatives and facilitate collaborations and removing some of the barriers that we could talk more about in the bigger discussion. Funding was a big deal. Um, and so uh, one of the things that really came out is funding for community-based orgs. How can they access opportunities, infrastructure and resources, not, not necessarily depending on institutions and PIs, but giving folks agency to apply for this money themselves. Um, I think one of the, the things, and all of these bullets kind of reinforce that point. And so we, we discussed training uh, and learning uh, in the next question, but having a purposeful and intentional um, component of this learning to address these power dynamics um, and including in funding. So what Dr. Lett brought out in terms of these diversity supplements <laughs> was a valid point. I think I've heard this and experienced this in some ways, but diversity supplements are awarded to PIs and not to the folks. And they may or may not apply to uh, community engaged research or equity, pain equity and disparities research. They could be in whatever, right? But if the person leaves, the PI still gets to keep the money. So we need to reimagine how that goes. Um, so I wanted to bring that out. Um, and so these are some other bullet points. Uh, I think the community engagement piece, I think the first group did an amazing job in talking about you know, these core components uh, that, that are really important. And I think for us, we were just talking about what type of training, learning opportunities can we get, can we create or develop to facilitate community engagement in a good way, in an appropriate way. So then the next question that we were tasked with, and this was just, a, these were prompts to kind of get the conversation going, um, were what are these core competencies? And one of core competencies that researchers need to develop meaningfully, to do research in health equity in a meaningful way. Um, and we discussed at the outset, do we need to call them competencies? Because 
when you think of that, it's like a checklist. It's like, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I did in, in, you know, internal reflection check in a way that's kind of a one-off instead of an ongoing thing. Um, so we can leave that open to discussion, um, but we did talk about that. Um, in terms of the major themes that came out, uh, clinical applications and outcomes, um, I think many of us have poor competencies in our, in our healthcare disciplines, uh, but they don't necessarily center around equity, pain equity or health equity. It's like, can you pick up a patient without them falling down, <laughs> right? But broadening that, in the clinical space, in the clinical training space, uh, in the research space. Um, engage me with diverse perspectives. Um, I think everyone here, we've heard this recurring theme about including those folks with lived experiences um, in the conversation earlier rather than later. The One of the big uh, topics that came out of for competency of, of out of this question were personal attributes. We kind of use we use this um, article by Fishman that determined the core competencies for pain research and management back in 2012, but it didn't really address the cultural context and personal attributes part of this. And so, our in our discussion, we focused almost exclusively on that because we feel we felt that that was a key component of folks understanding and learning how to do this work in a meaningful way. So that dominated the conversation. Um, aspects of mentorship came into this, com this part of the conversation as well. Um, and not just acknowledging positionality, um, and recognizing your own limitations, but putting folks' individual core values at the forefront and doing that with intentionality. In our conversation, you know, we try to include everyone's perspectives. We have our scientific and clinical lenses through which we see things, but we wanted to know from the, our people with lived experiences, what would you want to see as a cultural competency or as a competency? And I think that leading with that question when we're talking about community engaged research and training people in that is important. Uh, we talked about um, in terms of competencies, heterogeneity in research, Dr. Gooden brought that out in his talk um, and in the discussion, because statistically, you know, the data is messy um, and it's supposed to be messy. So how do we change the culture of homogeneity and sameness, which is, you know, honestly a construct of white supremacy to um, heterogeneity and embracing that and using the newer statistical analysis tools that have come out since we've trained. Um, so Dr. Lett brought out, you know, let's let that, let these, this heterogeneity be a signpost coupled with the lived experiences of folks to, cre to create and reimagine new study design uh, and research questions that inform said novel and important study designs so that that informs the methodology by which we analyze and interpret the data. Um, I want community engagement and advocacy uh, also came out in our discussion. Um, how do we develop methods for measuring and evaluating, evaluating these personal attributes, right? We can evaluate whether or not you know some of the you know, putative pain assessment and measurement tools, but how can we evaluate if you are fit for human consumption to do this type of work? Um, and understanding and leveraging community health and cultural practices, as many have alluded to already, there have been communities who have been doing this work themselves for years because they didn't have an infrastructure to lean on. How do we use that knowledge and create knowledge sharing tools so that we can leverage what they've done 
and bring the heft of our institutions and our funding to the fore. And so the, the last part of our discussion was what would the training look like? And again, we, you know, language matters. So we were taught, so Dr. Kapos was like, well, should we call it training or should, what did you call it? Training. Yes. Um, rising. Like, so, and learning and unlearning things. So if we've been in a research space for a long time, we've learned and unlearned, or we should be unlearning some things that have been impediments to health equity to this point. Um, so experiential learning and, rec and recognizing that people in their training, whether it be clinical, whether it be research, need to engage with communities and people with lived experiences, no matter what type of science they're doing. If you're studying zebrafish, that's fine, but if you're using that as a model to study a chronic pain population, intersect with chronic that said chronic pain population. Um, and exploring inequity and diversity, how to, uh, exploring the intersectionality of pain disparities and all of the you know, types of biases, systemic and individual. Um, and, and really the, we had a conversation in different ways about shifting these power dynamics. And right now our research infrastructure is very hierarchical in which communities are at the bottom of that hierarchy, but they know the most. So how could we shift that dynamic to move communities and their, and their advocates to the forefront of the research enterprise in terms of acknowledgement and funding. And then implementing this across and evaluating, there was some discussion about whether or not we even need to do this, um, evaluating across the career span, um, community involvement again came up, um, resource allocation and support. So we we charged NIH <laughs> uh, with the with the task of creating the infrastructure at this level to do some of the to execute some of these things, and we came with questions, but we also talked about potential solutions, um, which I think is very important in a conversation like this. And reimagining and unlearning uh, again, speaking to the fact that. We've learned these traditional models of doing research that have been perpetuated for hundreds of years. How can we reimagine it and not necessarily retrofit these things, these tools and methodologies that were anchored in white supremacy by white supremacists and try to retrofit it to a population for which said white supremacists didn't care about, right? Um, so I thought that was cool. So these were, so Dr. Baker asked us at the very end to give a sentence or two about our main takeaways. And so these are uh, some of the takeaways. It's complex topic, everybody says that, but it's worthy of an ongoing conversation. The energy with which we brought, uh, brought the conversation uh, was, was a selling point. People learned a lot. Um, and people with lived experiences or their family members, um, and we talked about that, um, and their social support networks. We can't just focus on the person. We got to focus on the family, employment, and other, inter, you know, other dyads or multiple spokes of interaction that that person has. Um, humans are complex. Reimagine, reform, retrofit if you can or just blow it all up and create something new. Um, what is diversity and expertise and knowledge? You know, how at NIH do we respect this? Particularly when diversity and expertise and knowledge fluctuates over a lifespan and in a career. 